five. There's a bit of a sigh of relief, isn't there? We've been in this constant perma crisis. I think there are some people who feel he unjustly stabbed Boris, but I think the general feeling is we've got to all get behind him. We're certainly going to see this young man, the youngest prime minister, of course, for 200 years, tested to the full. We're in the land of so many multiple U-turns. It's like the roundabouts in Swindon. One. We have left Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So it's Dishy Rishi in number 10 with hunky Jeremy Hunt <laughs> still as Chancellor. This is a shiny new Tory government. Yet three of the four great officers of state, Chancellor, Home Secretary and Foreign Secretary, are the same people originally appointed by Liz Truss. The outgoing Prime Minister acquitted herself with dignity as she bowed out of the top job, despite being the shortest serving Prime Minister in history. Trust resigned after just 45 days in Downing Street, her premiership lasting less time than the extended Tory leadership contest she fought (laughs) and won to bag the job in the first place. Our economic difficulties continue, Alison. The ONS released figures this week showing pasta prices up 60% over the last 12 months. Tea and milk now costing 30 or 40% more. These figures show that for lower income households who spend a higher share of their money on such essentials, the headline inflation figure showing the cost of living just 10% higher than a year ago is a sick joke. It's been a big week on the political front, Alison. New Prime Minister and a related cabinet overhaul. But relentless, always on our minds, the economic news is punching through too. <laughs> so what do you make of it all, co-pilot, wielding your newly discovered economic expertise? <laughs> Tell us, what does the future hold? We'll be having the Pearson Economic In-Depth Breakdown shortly. The Alison Pearson Memorial <laughs> Bank of England lecture. <laughs> <laughs> the markets are poised. Me and Mervyn King, we're like that. We're like that. Before we go any further, what is this hunky Jeremy Hunt, the man with all the animal magnetism of a biro refill? Well, uh, I, I could think of other adjectives <laughs> starting with an H, but I thought because <laughs> because I I know I know that you like sort of natty natty Tories, and he's a kind of natty Tory. He looks a bit like a thunderbird, you know. Mm, you like the sort of no. Mark Harper. I mean, Jeremy yeah. Hunt. You, you like you like them the fresh-faced boys next door yeah but he's not your cup of tea is he this one very much not my cup of tea i have to say <laughs> should we start by saying that um the last time we met as it were was actually in person at our wonderful live planet normal event which was just the best atmosphere wasn't it it was just lovely and just to just to show how rapidly events are overtaking us Liam the last time we spoke Suella Braverman had just resigned as Home Secretary back in the previous times and now she's back as Home Secretary I mean blink and you miss it and we felt then didn't we that Liz Truss's premiership was was teetering on the edge of the cliff and then we were you know, straight into another leadership contest. Boris bouncing back from the Dominican Republic to cause chaos. HMS Penelope Mordant, full steam ahead. And Rishi Sunak rejected by the party members just six weeks earlier, soon establishing a commanding lead. And lo and behold, now the Prime Minister, not universal acclaim, uh, Liam, certainly not amongst conservative ranks but we can we can dissect that I thought despite my doubts I thought he had a cracking debut at Prime Minister's questions absolutely swatting Starmer's attack lines all over the place and really interesting something I hadn't really anticipated suddenly looking young modern and quite cool compared to pale stale Starmer what do you think co-pilot yeah, I think he certainly made a, a good debut. PMQs, it is very much parliamentary theatre, but these things do matter. These clips that get on the tea time broadcast news in terms of morale among the parliamentary rank and file. But of course, the MPs wanted him. We'll never know if the Tory activists, the grassroots members mm. wanted him because, of course, they didn't have a vote with Penny Morden bowing out at the very last minute. We can discuss that. I think what's happened since 
The Tories stop warring, at least for now. And on the surface, we've seen government borrowing costs fall very sharply from mm. that 10 year guilt yield that we're now all expert in, particularly you, co pilot, <laughs> from 4.1%. It's fallen to 3.6% as we record Planet Normal. That's a massive half a percentage point drop in the government borrowing cost a rate of borrowing that ripples out across the economy, determining mortgage rates, rates on other personal loans and so on. Vitally important to policymaking. The pound has recovered a bit back where it was in mid-September. There are many, many reasons for this. Of course, political types want to say it's all about Rishi. It's all about the personalities. It isn't. It's largely about falling wholesale gas prices, the slowdown in the rate of increase of US house prices, the fact that the economy is slowing. That means in many ways inflation may be lower, so guilt yields drop. These are aspects of this debate that you very, very rarely hear in the media, but that doesn't mean that they're not true. But the overall impression, justifiably, is that the markets have calmed since the time of the mini budget. And now the government, rightly, again, I think, they took my advice because I suggested that they do this on GB News. <laughs> They've pushed the date of that crucial yes. financial statement back from Halloween, which was always a headline writer's dream, a ridiculous date to set any kind of financial statement uh, of any kind, particularly when the government's under pressure. It's now going to be November the 17th with the government asserting itself, trying to give the impression that they are in control of events, not the financial markets. Isn't it ironic, though, because it seems just a few short weeks ago, and it was, when Kwasi Kwarteng was insisting that the date of that parliamentary statement, the fiscal MOT, if you like, was going to be November the 23rd. It's now November the 17th. Mm. In order to sort of bring it forward a week, we've had lots and lots of political pyrotechnics left a lot of people across the country scared and bewildered by our political process. But it does now seem to me, barring, you know, a few nasty stories in the Sunday papers that could see the cabinet discombobulate and fall to pieces again, it does now seem to me that we won't see a general election until the Tories call it, which will be possibly late 2023, even into 2024. I think there's a, a bit of a sigh of relief, isn't there? We've been in this constant perma crisis, which I think <laughs> yeah. people just good, good phrase. feel absolutely exhausted by. I mean, you'll still know more about this, despite my astonishing progress. But I did read that <laughs> the Treasury might be looking at double digit spending cuts across all departments for that autumn statement. I mean, tough times ahead. I thought Rishi Sunak, he is Britain's third prime minister in seven weeks. I think he did correctly judge that no one was in the mood for celebrating. You'll notice, Liam, that, you know, in his first speech outside number 10, there was no smiling, no beaming family there. It wasn't triumphal. It was almost penitential. Yeah. And I think that... They're now talking about stability, unity and compassion. That's replaced growth, growth, growth. That was Liz Truss's phrase. We're going to be hearing a lot about stability and compassion. I think that the party is in frank disarray. I don't think we should be deceived by the, the shine, the shiny suited appearance of unity. The whole trust for Argo has really upset Tory members in the country. I wrote about that in my column, my Telegraph column this week. We've heard about the Tory party website collapsing, a rumour that at least a fifth of members in the country have cancelled their membership. I met quite a few Conservatives over the weekend and they were, some of them were absolutely head in their hands, some wanting Boris back, some furious that Boris was making his usual merry mayhem for his own selfish reasons. I was very pleased that he pulled out. I think we've got a few questions to answer, for lots of questions to answer. Does Rishi Sunak really have a mandate. He said in his Downing Street speech that the 2019 election mandate belongs to him. Personally, I think that democracy is fraying pretty badly now that we are two leaders 
distant from Boris Johnson, fending off a general election is, of course, vital because one of the recent polls had the Conservatives on average of 32 points behind Labour. So it would be an absolute extinction level event if they did go to the country. But as you said, Sunak didn't even go to the members. I think he knows he would not only lose a general election, but would quite likely have lost with the members as well. By electing him, the Conservatives are pretty much now ceded the red wall to Labour. In Sunak, we have an emollient centrist who's going to do an awful lot to soothe the Tories and the Shires, who were threatening to mutiny and vote Lib Dem over Boris's antics. We saw what happened, Liam, didn't we, in Tiverton and Honiton and Chesham and Amersham. But I'm wondering how it will play out, really, soothing the blue Shires, but jettisoning the Red Wall. I think there's something in that. But before we move to that central conundrum of the Conservative Party, I want to ask you about Penny because you were an ardent backer of Penny Morden. We both met Penny Morden for dinner. Adieu, if you like. Had a long chat with her, got to know her. I think it's fair to say she's been a favourite of this podcast. And as you said at the fabulous Planet Normal live event last week, in your view, and I think there's something in this, she is the, the, the one leader who can really straddle that electoral divide in the sense that she can soothe the shires who are thinking about voting Lib Dem, yet with her very proletarian background, her classless accent, her general sort of no-nonsense, every woman approach, she could also shore up some of those red wall seats. So how do you feel that Penny did withdraw, to coin a phrase, you know, almost with just seconds to go before the 2pm deadline? Do you think she actually had the backers or do you think she fell slightly short of that threshold of 100 MPs in her camp? I think they were very much relying on Boris pulling out and picking up people from him. I think that you'll notice, Liam, that Sir Gavin Williamson, actually never to be called Sir Gavin on Planet Normal, Gavin Williamson, master of the dark arts, relatively late in the day, Suella Braverman declared for Rishi, effectively delivering the ERG, the more right wing of the party. And we know what she was promised, don't we? (laughs) So Penny was outplayed in a game of chess. My support for Penny, I've always said this, my politics are definitely to the right of Penny Mordaunt's, but I felt that going into a general election through this terrible cost of living crisis, Penny came from a very, very modest home, won her Portsmouth constituency. It was a safe Labour seat with her tremendous perseverance and charisma. She converted that to a, a relatively safe Tory seat now. So I always thought she'd have the va va for the Red Wall whilst uh, soothing the, the more mainstream Conservatives. I'm feeling more positive about Rishi Sunak today, but I think that the bald fact is a Prime Minister worth £730 million and a Chancellor worth £14 million are about to tell people on the minimum wage that austerity is good for them. I think we can foresee what Labour's going to say, can't we, Liam? It is an open goal for Labour. You know, politics is a contact sport, as we've said. It's not always fair. I'm sure Liz Truss would agree, and we should talk about her as well. Mm. But it is very much an open goal when you've got somebody who's so wealthy, who hasn't always shown signs of really understanding how ordinary people live for all his charisma and and smooth delivery. And Jeremy Hunt as well is also extremely wealthy. Both of them are self-made men, albeit that a lot of Rishi Sunak's wealth is by marriage. But, you know, he made a lot of money in his own right before his marriage to the daughter of one of India's biggest business tycoons. Mm. Uh, So I think it is going to be difficult for the Conservatives. It may turn out, though, Alison, that the fiscal black hole that everyone's talking about. It's funny, isn't it, how our public finances, as far as the media are concerned, there's always either a black hole or a war chest. There's sort of nothing in between. The fiscal accounts may not be as tight as we're all saying, because if gas prices continue to fall and they're down sharply, 
they went under 100 euros per megawatt hour on European markets earlier this week, down from 350 euros per megawatt hour as recently as August, that big spike. But if gas prices are are lower than we thought they would be, albeit they're still twice as high as they have been on average over the last 10 years, but if they're down from where we thought they would be, if government borrowing costs are down from where we thought they would be if we can get just a bit of growth going in the economy and that's a big if if those three things come together or two of those three things then the public finances look a whole lot more rosy though by no means flush and Rishi Sunak may be able to avoid some of those tough decisions I think it's very very significant that just as we're going to record planet normal the government has let it be known that they are not particularly minded to observe what we call the triple lock. Yeah. That is a 2019 manifesto commitment. Interestingly, Rishi Sunak has upheld the moratorium on fracking, which is in the 2019 manifesto, but he's now signalling that he's moving away from the 2019 manifesto commitment to observe the triple lock. That is that pension, the basic state pension, must go up by either inflation or the rate of increase of average earnings or 2.5%, whichever is the higher. And, of course, the highest of those three this year is inflation, which is at 10.1% in September. Traditionally, we uprate the basic state pension the following April by the rate of inflation in September and a 10.1% increase in the basic state pension. That's 12, 13 billion pounds there, you know, immediately. And of course, once you've made that increase, that's going to be with us forever. So that's a huge financial commitment. Rishi Sunak now saying that that may not happen, that will infuriate lots of pensioners. The Tories must be calculating that they'd rather help pensioners who are going to vote Tory anyway, to a lesser degree, Mm. if it means they can have more money to focus particularly on vulnerable pensioners and people up and down the age range, particularly hardworking families who may get no pay rise at all, despite 10% inflation. So that would be a very, very grown-up move and a risky move and a move that would be condemned by lots of people if indeed they don't observe that triple lock. Also, I think it will be really interesting, you'll remember that it was Rishi's rise in national insurance, wasn't it? I'm not even has it has that even gone through yet? It was going up by was it one point two five percentage points? And that really was Rishi doing that to put Boris on the naughty step and say, You've been going mad with the credit card, but I'm gonna show you that these things cost money and so I'm going to put up this tax. Then trust was Liz Trust was reversing that rise in national And that reverse has gone through Parliament. But you know, big question mark there, might he then reverse reverse? I mean we're we're we're, we're in the land of so many multiple U turns. It's like it's like the roundabouts in Swindon, isn't it, Liam? Should I tell you what I'm upset about? So I'm generally feeling very positive. I thought that Rishi Sunak cut a very impressive and modern figure at the dispatch box. I think there is a danger that the Remainers will see Rishi as the one to get us back into the EU, even though he was notionally at least a Brexiteer. We've seen some early salvos from the Rejoin campaign. I don't know if you heard it. They had this guy, Guy Hands, hedge fund billionaire and Tory donor popped up on the Today programme, basically bashing Brexit and talking as if he personally runs the country. Now, I was I was appalled to hear that. I do understand that Rishi Sunak has to appease the markets because we're up to our necks in debt. But I have a little worry that he is the markets and the bank's creature. Or is his loyalty going to be to the ordinary working people? Liam, I just want to read you this quote, which is from Bloomberg. Came under the headline, Hedge funds get their first prime minister in UK's Rishi Sunak. It says, in many ways, Rishi Sunak won his new job because investors use the markets to push for change. So is is the United Kingdom now a, a, a plaything of, of Mr Guy Hans, who I believe resides in tax exile in the Channel Islands? I think there are a lot of people who worry that that's the case. Rishi Sunak is certainly somebody who hails from high finance as opposed to a commercial background. He makes a lot about the fact that his parents started their own business. 
and and they did and that's that's fair enough but his own professional experience is overwhelmingly in investment management companies and investment banks and and so on and there will be a concern that he will take on a kind of globalist agenda which very much includes getting britain back in the eu i th- i thought it was an astonishing intervention by guy hands it was a sort of fact free zone mm. on the today program and and very little effort was made to question yeah. what his assertions no effort at all was there i was shouting i was shouting at the radio i, I, I bet I, you were i've always been a little bit more diplomatic than you alison but you're <laughs> you're you're completely right i think rishi sunak is going to have to be very much on his best behavior because the people who really delivered the premiership to him the people who really stopped if you like, Penny Morden getting decisively over that 100-member threshold and allowing uh, herself to go forward to the members across the Tory shires, where I think she would have beaten Rishi Sunak, and I'm sure you'd agree. But the parliamentary faction that really stopped that happening were the ERG, were the European Research Group, who it seems that they did a deal where it was their champion, Swella Braverman, back in the Home Office, uh, but they sacrificed... Penny Morden, who was, of course, herself a Brexiteer, as was Rishi Sunak. But Rishi Sunak did very little campaign during Brexit, and there was very little sign when he was at the Treasury that he was trying to put those Brexit freedoms to good use, albeit, you know, he obviously had the pandemic to deal with. But it, I think a slightly reassuring thing was that one of the best attack lines that Keir Starmer was exposed to from Rishi Sunak at PMQs was the new prime minister jabbing his finger at the Labour leader across the dispatch box and saying, this is the guy who tries to reverse the biggest vote in the history of British democracy, which Keir Starmer did. He tries to be a a clever, clever, silky lawyer uh, to try and, you know, manoeuvre us out of Brexit. And I don't think Keir Starmer will ever have a hope of becoming prime minister until he issues a full mere culpa speech where he says, to Red Wall voters, I am really sorry I did this. I, I talk to people in the Labour Party about this all the time. I think that is the major electoral Achilles heel that he has. So the fact that Sunak used that in his first PMQs, it would be very, very difficult for him to then take the UK out of the single, uh, back into the single market. Because, of course, within the single market, the UK can't make its own laws in many areas. The UK is overseen by the European Court of Justice, which is an entirely, almost entirely political court. And of course, you can't be in the single market without freedom of movement. So it's a major reversal of Brexit. To say you've done Brexit, but you're in the single market is a complete nonsense. It's a complete nonsense. The single market is the major legal construct of European Union membership. The customs union is second to that, though it's still very significant. So I know what you mean, Alison. I too was bewildered by that ridiculous interview unchallenged by Guy Hans, who he anyway. But I think the fact that Rishi had that line so front and central in his earliest sort of properly public moments as Prime Minister in front of the ERG as they roared their support from the back benches, the parliamentary faction who really above all put him there is reassuring from a Brexit point of view. And I desperately needed to hear you say that to me just for the, because I thought that, but I thought Liam will explain it to me. One of the many reasons I was glad actually that that Boris didn't succeed in in getting over the hundred, even though he claimed in that marvellous Johnsonian way that mere bagatelle, darling, mere bagatelle, whether I've actually got the hundred or not. But of course, the media full of Boris loathing would have absolutely, you know, it would have been absolutely exploded, wouldn't they? And I think this is quite interesting, something I've been noticing in the last few days, Liam. Rishi Sunak's heritage as a British Asian, I can already tell that the left liberal media are giving him more leeway than they gave to Liz Truss, certainly, certainly to Boris, who's, you know, for whom they were consumed by an absolute profound, irrational hatred. But I saw that Emily Maitlis had tweeted enthusiastically about Sunak how he'd used the word compassion. So I think that the usual suspects who never rest hate the Tories, and that's most of the mainstream media, as we've established many times on Planet Nor, they won't be baying for Rishi Sunak's 
blood right away. I do think he has an inner Thatcherite, but I think they will tolerate him because he looks like a figure from modern Britain. Rishi Sunak rightly makes very little of being a Hindu, of, you know, being from an Indian family. He's British. He's as British as you are, as I am. And that's exactly how it should be. It's the left. It's never the Conservatives that have played diversity politics. And yet, of course, ironically, once again, I think, have we got Three out of the four main jobs of state now, co-pilot, are occupied by non-white people. But I, I think that Rishi's British Asian heritage will be his superpower with the media, which hates the Tories because they will hold back a slight bit. Do you think that could be right? It is three of the four great offices of state, Alison. I'm proud of that. I don't think that would happen in any other advanced country at this time. I think the fact that it's happened in Britain without fuss or mannerism, without diversity quotas and positive discrimination is a brilliant thing. In terms of Emily Maitlis, I think a lot of the media who have been very hostile to the Tories, of course, will be angling to get interviews with Rishi Sunak. You know, interviews don't land in your lap when you leave the BBC. So she's maybe wooing him over social media. And in terms of Boris, I actually think he made a tactical withdrawal, that word again. He knows it's going to be a tough time economically. He knows the media are out to get him. He knows that that Commons Committee will give him a really hard time over eating cake. And I think he is deliberately decided to sit this one out until he can come back again. Right now, the whole world is watching China. It's the 20th Party Congress, a twice in a decade political set piece that reveals the outcome of China's very secretive leadership selection. And there is, of course, only one man in the running. Xi Jinping. This is seismic. After the death of Chairman Mao Zedong, there has been a two-term limit on Chinese leaders. No more. Xi is on the cusp of effectively becoming ruler for life. Understanding him has never been more important. They turned this place into a hell. We're in Beijing. We, we see business people got disappear by the day all the time. I mean, everything is protected and you're under constant watch. But reporting on Xi? Well, that might be my toughest assignment yet. I've come into a bathroom now to try to upload all these files in case on my way out I get stopped and searched and they try to delete these. Despite 10 years in power, he remains a puzzle. One we know very little about beyond official propaganda. Who is he really? How has he managed to build a cult of personality? What kind of a leader has this made him? And what does that mean for all of us? China under Xi doesn't like these sorts of questions. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! But I'm going to try and ask them anyway. I'm Sophia Yan, and this is How to Become a Dictator from The Telegraph. Now, for many weeks, our airwaves have been chock full of politicians opining about this and that, Alison. Ministers, ex-ministers, soon-to-be ministers, droning on and on. So Planet Normal thought it was a moment to hear from the people, at least from one esteemed Planet Normal citizen, Alison, a mum of two and habitual Tory voter, who hails from rural North Essex. A long-term Planet Normal fan, Alison shared her thoughts with co-pilot Pearson and myself on many occasions, including on email and at our live events. She's got a degree in history and politics. She's worked in the city and also for various children's charities. As a Conservative Party member, Alison backed Boris Johnson as leader in mid-2019, when he triumphed over Jeremy Hunt, of course. And the Tory Frank and file didn't get a say in the appointment of our latest Prime Minister, which made some members angry. So I started by asking Alison in her first ever media interview how she was feeling. Now Rishi Sunak's in number 10. Well, first of all, thanks so much for asking me on. I can't really believe it. My favourite podcast, which I haven't missed a single episode of. (laughs) I'm feeling quite optimistic. I think we've got to unite behind Rishi. 
He seems honest. He seems full of integrity and compassion. And I think the party have got to unite behind him. And we're all fed up with this internecine war amongst the Tory MPs. I guess what I should ask you, Alison, we've emailed a lot in the past. We had a chat over a drink after that live event in central London last week. You have been a Boris Johnson fan in the past. You previously voted for Boris Johnson as a Conservative member before he actually became Prime Minister. Are you disappointed he didn't stand and the way in which he didn't stand? Well, I think his supporters are probably furious that yet again he stood down having, I think, quotes from somebody else led them uphill and down again. I think we all loved when he came in, first of all. He was charismatic. It was called the Boris Bounce. Remember when he was mayor of London, all the builders would shout out, morning, Boris. He's not a detail man. And he didn't listen to the Barrington scientists, which you so ably publicised. He listened to the sage lot, and it's cost us hugely economically, medically. So I believe he's a campaigner, not a manager. I don't think this is the time for him. So I'm not disappointed he's not standing. That's interesting, Alison. You talked there about the scientist who signed the Great Barrington Declaration. The original signatories were, of course, Shinetra Gupta, Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford, Martin Koldorf, who was at Harvard, some of the world's leading epidemiologists. They wanted sort of discretionary shielding, didn't they? Lockdown only for those people who wanted to be part of lockdown, who were older, who had pre-existing conditions, with the rest of us getting on with our lives. Why do you think it is that Boris didn't go for that, Alison, because initially at the very beginning of lockdown in early 2020, he was showing signs of he wasn't going to be panicked. He was going to be a little bit more liberal. Absolutely. I don't know, Liam. I think, dare I say, I think he's a bit lazy. I think he was nervous about making the wrong decision, understandably. But I think he didn't think through the cost, medium term, long term, economically, and the cost of all these poor people who have been undiagnosed with long-term and short-term conditions, some of them critical. And I think he just plumped for what was safe. He had his two chaps standing beside him every time and he just wouldn't listen to them. How was lockdown for you, Alison? A lot of people, the isolation was obviously upsetting. The inability to see family was obviously unnerving and emotionally difficult. How do you feel about lockdown now, looking back and When you look forward, what about the prospects of it happening again? Well, looking back, I think we were all in sort of halcyon days during lockdown one. The weather was beautiful. A lot of us had our children at home and it was a novelty. I was very worried about our aged mother-in-law, Granny, who actually died sort of as a result of lockdown. My other aunt, aged 90, has definitely deteriorated mentally from being so isolated. That's a real concern. After that, it became, oh, another lockdown, as though it was perfectly normal. It was amazing how everybody just seemed to accept it. Alison, of course, there was a lot of damage during lockdown. Kids didn't go to school. A lot of those kids haven't gone back, the so-called ghost children. There's been a lot of scarring in terms of mental health. There's a huge economic hangover. We printed £450 billion of, of money, at least the Bank of England did, which has helped generate this inflation. Do you think as a society, as a media and political class, you watching on from the outside, and I know you're a very, very avid consumer of a whole range of media, do you think we're yet owning up to the damage that lockdown caused? Do you think we're properly examining on a sort of cost-benefit basis the extent to which lockdown worked or didn't work? Absolutely not. It's a disgrace and I think could easily happen. We could easily be placed in lockdown again. And I think the long term economic impact is horrendous. As I mentioned before, the people, you know, without private health insurance, and even that was difficult to, to find anybody. Dentists, you couldn't go to a dentist, you couldn't find one. Children, it, it's horrendous. My um, son's girlfriend was a teacher and they, she was with us during the whole of lockdown one. And she was giving classes online in London. And those who couldn't get to computers, you know, they were desperately trying to get computers out to them. Babies who haven't developed properly because the only people they have met whilst out shopping, which you were allowed to do, were wearing masks. They haven't properly developed their speech because, you know, they couldn't see mouths. 
the isolation for teenagers, the lack of hope for us. You know, we've got hobbies, but I think for teenagers and for single mothers in flats, the parks were closed. The rules were ridiculous. Some of the rules were absolutely ridiculous. Alison, let's just move on to the present day. Think about Liz Truss as Prime Minister. Do you think she was treated fairly? It was a difficult time because obviously Her Majesty the Queen um, appointed her and then died shortly afterwards. So I think it was difficult for her perhaps to sell some of her ideas because it would seem impertinent and rude. But she had some of the right ideas, low tax, but she didn't sell them and she didn't prepare the markets or us for what she wanted to do. And she disappeared it was absolutely extraordinary. You know, she absolutely disappeared. And so did the Chancellor for a while. So I think history will judge her sadly. And I feel very sorry for her on a human level, but just not being up to the job. That's interesting that you talk about the timing of events. It is extraordinary when you think about it, that as she was announcing from the dispatch box, her energy price cap and a raft of measures, literally in the middle of her speech, word went round the House of Commons, Operation London Bridge, as they say, that Her Majesty's life was sadly coming to an end. Do you think she just lacked the personality to be a prime minister? I think I found her a bit robotic. I think a lot of people did. If you think about the last X number of Tory prime ministers we've had, all their personalities have varied hugely. And it's not really about personality, is it? It's about leadership. And she obviously believed she could do it. But, you know, I don't know. What do you think, Liam? I think there's a danger, Alison, that some of the ideas that she espoused which are not only respectable and responsible, but I would say necessary, like trying to get growth going, like trying to break us out of this sort of humdrum, low productivity stagnation that we seem to be in, in here in the UK. I think her ideas were absolutely spot on. And I think the fact that she didn't sell them properly, I agree with you on that, means that the actual ideas themselves have been sullied and may not come back for a year or two because people will just say, oh, that's trustonomics. That was tried and the market markets went nuts. That's wrong. Absolutely. But reducing high rate tax from 45% to 40% at a time when everybody is so anxious, the middle classes are being squeezed, was a really bad signal. I understand that the cap on bankers' bonuses, that was a contentious issue as well, but it just was the wrong signal to the country, I think. At the wrong time, you should do those kind of things when the country's feeling flush, right? Again, the, the actual policy, lowering the top rate of tax from 45 to 40, where it was for the whole of the Blair era, that's not a kind of, you know, mad, libertarian, Hayekian economic policy. That's reasonable economics. But it was timing, 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 right? And timing is everything in politics. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about the young then. Obviously, you're a proud mum. Do you think that your kids' generation is less well off than their parents? Not your specific circumstances, but I mean in the round. We have a lot of discussion about this, Liam, amongst the family, amongst their young friends. I think they are very aggrieved as a generation. I think they believe that the Tories serve older voters, the haves, for example, the triple lock. I think, sadly, a lot of them, unless Rishi changes things, will vote Lib Dem or Labour next time. They feel they're in debt, they have low income, high house prices, and they don't think it's worth saving at the moment because their money goes nowhere. And they are very angry about it. Interest rates are still very low. Obviously, they're rising, but they're way below the rate of inflation, which, as is obvious, it means you obviously lose money if you put it in the bank and the interest rate is less than the inflation. And then you get taxed on that meagre interest, don't you? It is very, very difficult for youngsters to save money to buy a home. What do you think is the impact of that, Alison? What do you feel in your bones that does to a generation? Because buying a home, it's not just about the money, is it? I think they think our generation, and with some good reason, have had a jolly good time and have managed to buy our houses, at, you know, a certain amount of times per salary and risen up the housing ladder. I think they lack hope. And I think also because of COVID, they're all now working part-time at home or in the office. 
They're not learning through osmosis in the offices as much as they should do. And I just think they lack hope and they're getting very angry about it. If the young aren't on board and a lot of older natural conservative voters like you, Alison, are pretty miffed at the grassroots level, can Rishi Sunak win a general election? I think if he is honest with people, if he delivers, the problem is it's all again so short term, which is part of our biggest problem in politics, I believe, at the moment. You know, our power storage has been left to nil. We need to become more self-sufficient. We need stability. You know, small and medium-sized businesses need to feel that they can buy goods at an X price rather than, you know, the price is going through the roof. You know, the cost of some essential items going up 60 percent. People are terrified. Do you think then he can turn it round? There isn't much time, as you say. There is a wave of goodwill at the moment, at least on the Tory backbenches. Let's start with the kind of people that you know best. Let's start, if I may, Alison, with the Tory grassroots before we move to voters as a whole, because it's people like you, the envelope stuffers, the door knockers, the members at the local level. You will know many, many Tory activists. Are they going to get out there and campaign for Rishi Sunak? Or is there still a sense that this is the guy who stabbed Boris? This is the guy for him. It's all about the power. I think there are some people who feel he unjustly stabbed Boris, but I think the general feeling is we've got to all get behind him. Everybody is fed up with party politics and we've got to unite for the sake of the economy, for the sake of the general public and for the sake of our standing abroad. Absolutely, 100%. Some guy called Nigel Farage, he says that uh, the Tory party faces extinction. He thinks there's going to be a split, four chancellors in as many months, five prime ministers in six years. It's not very conservative, is it? No, it's not. But we've got to stop causing trouble. We've got to all unite for the sake of the country. You know, we've got a crisis with Russia and Ukraine. We've got China to worry about. And, you know, Labour have got very little to offer as an alternative. I mean, Rachel Reeves actually comes across quite well compared to, dare I say, Starmer. But, you know, we all believe in conservative principles. And I think Rishi, if he can deliver on the economy and we can get back to low taxes and a stable economy, people will stick with the Tories if we can. You mentioned Rachel Reeves there, Alison. That's somebody who co-pilot Alison and I have discussed on and off over recent months. She you do feel, do you, as a, as a voter, that she comes across quite credibly? She used to work at the Bank of England, of course. She's a safe pair of hands, certainly a lot safer than Jeremy Corbyn's shadow chancellor, John McDonnell. And this is the point, isn't it? Starmer doesn't need to be all that good. Rachel Reeves doesn't need to be all that good to be a lot better than what Labour were previously offering as far as middle of the road swing voters are concerned. Yeah, absolutely. And as I say, it comes back to the young again. The Tories need to appeal to the young. They really do, because they're the people who are going to potentially vote for them in the future. And if they don't look after the young in many ways, I'm afraid it's not looking good for them. Alison, what do you think Rishi Sunak should do? What would you say to him if you were advising him? You've thought about politics a lot. You're a very assiduous voter, I know, from our email exchanges and the conversations that we've had. Tell me something that Rishi Sunak, in your view, isn't quite getting that he needs to get if he's going to deliver that election victory that you and so many other natural conservatives are so determined to see. I think he's got to have a breadth of experience in the cabinet and draw members from all sides of the party together. He's got to be compassionate, got to be honest with the country at all times, because trust in politics is an absolute low. And this has been a complete fiasco over the last few weeks. And I think as long as he remains full of integrity, compassion, we know he understands the market and he's got to just try and unite. You know, I think he said to the MPs in the House when he met them afterwards, that we've got to unite or die, and that's it. And I guess the final question, Alison, is what makes you such a huge Planet Normal fan? 
Well, I'd just like to say thank you, Liam, again, for asking me on. And I hope, you know, I've given a fair record of how us grassroots Tory voters feel. But I'd just like to thank you and Alison hugely for being our friend and family during all those lockdowns. You were always absolutely on top of the issues, always spoke good sense, intelligently, compassionately. And you were our vaccine of right thinking and humour every week. And we all feel part of the Planet Normal family. So thank you so much. Oh, co-pilot. Imagine a world run by Allisons. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> Must I? <laughs> You'd have a little kind of eunuch army of Liams running around at your every beck and call. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, I thought that Alison with the one L spoke brilliantly on behalf of the grassroots, making a lot of very good points. I think especially about the young. There's some stat I saw recently, which was, you know, such a vast proportion of the conservative votes are now in the over 50s. And no wonder other Alison and I, we have youngish adult children and uh, we've seen their disillusion and they really have very little reason to vote for the Conservatives and, and Alison of course also made the very good point about needing to have some kind of diversity in the cabinet to reflect the you know the quarrelling sections of the party and I think to be fair to Rishi that's that's what he's tried to do this week isn't it that a third of Liz Truss's appointees have gone He's got Suella back there at the Home Office. That's that's to please the ERG. I think Sunak himself perhaps going to be rather a, a David Cameron figure, but he has got this, you know, this this challenge of this sack of ferrets trying to reconcile them. I think it will be a sack of ferrets, Alison. Imagine how it's going to be when the public sector unions start really playing up. And Rishi Sunak is dealing with strike action under huge pressure mm. to award inflation-busting pay rises from the state's coffers. He's got Ben Wallace in there, of course, as Defence Secretary. He yeah. wants uh, defence spending to be 3% of GDP, not the normal 2%. He's welcomed back Andrew Mitchell, the former International Development Secretary, who wants us to be spending 0.7% of GDP on international aid, a UN commitment that mm. we've retreated from. As the winter goes on and politics really heats up, this kind of mini honeymoon period, which I do feel he's having at the moment, could rapidly turn to lots more infighting. We're certainly going to see this young man, the youngest prime minister, of course, for 200 years, tested to the full. At the top of the podcast, Liam, you you mentioned these as you know, terrible rises in in prices. We're, we're told by the ONS that inflation is ten point one percent. But as anyone who's been to a supermarket recently, um, I think I think they're actually chaining up the uh, the, the, the packets of Lurpak are now. Actually, it's like sort of um, like posh clothes in Bond Street. They're now, you know, what do you when mean? It's like diamond encrusted <laughs> necklaces. <laughs> God, a big tub of lure pack. It's a remortgage job. Absolutely. But what I was writing about in the column this week actually was this phenomenon, you'll be familiar with it, of shrinkflation. So uh, puzzled shoppers, uh, me among them this week, you know, getting to the cash out and wondering how we've managed to spend 120 quid when there's not very, very much in the basket. And I think that there's this sort of daylight diddling going on, Liam, where the packets are remaining the same size, but the quantities within them are going down and down. So soon it won't be a packet of crisps. It'll be a crisp in your packet. Loo rolls are suddenly doll size. Yeah, so this this uh, shrinkflation is going on. And, and as, as listeners have pointed out, the metric system makes it a lot easier for manufacturers to con us because we'd all notice if a pound weight went down to 14 ounces, but 454 grams to 425 grams is less noticeable. And I think this is a real concern as people are going, you know, going into this very, very difficult winter. Now on to our listener emails. Your message is sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We absolutely love to read them. And as Copilot Halligan will tell you very often, I pinch them wholesale and put them into my 
weekly column. Before we crack into the ones from listeners, Lionel Shriver, Liam, our guest from uh, last week at the wonderful live event, said, I had an absolute ball. That was a great crowd, warm, attentive, responsive. You and Liam have accumulated a devoted, loyal following. So many people are grateful to you both for giving them solace through such a dark time. Now, here are some of the selection, many selections of views we've had in, Liam, on the Tory leadership. Edward says, anyone who voted for Trust should hang their heads in shame. Members who voted for her made this country a laughing stock. She was clearly not all there from the very first moment. If people want to make trouble for Sunak, the Tories deserve everything they get. He is their only chance of some semblance of rehab. Otherwise, the wilderness beckons for a long, long time. And Alexandra says, I, for one, am perfectly happy for the coronation of Rishi Sunak. I think setting the bar at 100 MP backers was reasonable, given the number of MPs eligible to vote in this. It weeded out the stragglers and got straight to the final three. The fact that two stood down was their choice. I will not resign my membership or call for a general election, which we would certainly lose, and I will never vote for the other parties. It's time to be grown up and support Rishi Sunak. Here's a counter view from Ian. Dear co-pilots, could you remind everyone on Planet Normal that the main reason we're all in this sticky financial mess at the moment is because Rishi Sunak spent two years spraying free money all over the place. Come back, Rishi, all is forgiven is certainly not the answer. It's amazing how quickly the globalist cult of cheap money set upon Truss and Quateng for having the audacity to face off the Treasury orthodoxy and tell the Bank of England just to do its blinking job. Mandy has a similar view. The new PM keeps saying he's going to clear up Truss's mess, but I thought she was trying to clear up his mess. I think history is being rewritten. We need to remember we're in this mess due to the furlough scheme and all that net zero stuff that the government's been financing, along with many, many years of quantitative easing. We also need to stop paying money to all these lobby groups and charities. They have no right to finance anything with our money without our consent. In the column this week, Liam, I also talked about Eddie Izzard, who is going to be putting themselves up to be a candidate for the uh, Sheffield seat for Labour. And there's been quite a lot of controversy about Eddie. There was some suggestion that Eddie Izzard, the comedian, fantastically clever comedian, as we know, but would appear on a women only shortlist, which put the cat amongst the pigeons. And Sir Keir Starmer gave a speech to Pink News Awards, where he said he would introduce tougher LGBT hate crime laws and offences such as misgendering would be treated as aggravated offences. So if you or I uh, refuse to call someone like Eddie Izzard she, we might be making our way to prison. So that's something something to look forward to, Planet Normal listeners. But on that very subject, we had a couple of emails Nigel says, there is no escape. Wokeism has now infiltrated the private healthcare companies, making an appointment for a minor procedure. I was asked to state my sex. The drop-down menu did not allow me to state male. The only choice offered was man or trans man. Booper has thus robbed me of my sex. This is discrimination against me as a man, dangerous in a medical situation and unscientific for a medical organisation. I don't think even the NHS has gone this far. I loved the live Planet Normal last week. And on the same subject, Liam, Tim, not his real name, says... Alison, a fine and important piece in The Telegraph today on the subjugation of women. Thank you for leading the charge in the mainstream media. I attach a form sent to me by the NHS through InHealth, in which they ask in Section 7 if I am pregnant. To comply with male sensitivities, they have removed the word woman and replaced it with persons. In any case, the preamble in italics is otios. This is an insidious and subtle erosion of language, supposedly to seem inclusive, while cutting out a vast proportion of the population whose sensitivities are deemed irrelevant. This is from James. Dear Alison and Liam, first, thanks for the podcast, giving voice to those who are willing to challenge the prevailing groupthink with well thought out and well argued observations. It's been a great companion throughout the last two years. In my lifetime, we've had a prime minister that decided following America into a possibly illegal war in the Middle East was a good idea. One who oversaw the biggest financial crisis of a lifetime. Another who was so confident in the results of a referendum he himself called for 
that he didn't bother trying to back his position up, lost and then resigned. In the past few years, we've had a Prime Minister who called a general election, which saw her majority decrease, followed by another who oversaw the biggest loss of public liberty since the war and was forced out. Lastly, we've had the lettuce, who despite (laughs) arguably knowing what was needed for the economy to recover, made such a mess of it that she halved the previous record for the shortest serving Prime Minister. I'm in my late 20s, says James, and I've only been following politics for the past few years. As such, my question is, have our major politicians always been this incompetent? Mm. Additionally, how can we trust the new incumbent of number 10 to be an improvement? On the subject of shrinkflation, Liam, we've got this fascinating letter from Paul, who spent 40 years in the food industry, manufacturing, supplying ready meals to the major high street retailers. And Paul, uh, co-pilot, tells us about something called value engineering, which I'd never heard of. Paul says it's probably the most underhand and hardest to detect margin protection act of all. It was used when the customer, supermarkets that is, needed to take cost out of the business. Using a chicken curry ready meal as an example, the original product may have six cubes of chicken, a rich sauce to go with it and a relatively small amount of rice. Come hard times, one cube of chicken will be removed, the sauce will be reduced in quality, but a more spicy recipe will be developed, which is cheaper, and the amount of rice, often one of the less expensive ingredients, will be slightly increased. The new packaging will make some spurious claim about an improved recipe, now with a more spicy sauce, for example. I know that this practice still goes on, and actually, if you are on the lookout for it, it is all too too easy to detect. I do wish I had a library of packaging going back over the years to substantiate what I know to be true. Enough of my ramblings, but I hope they might be some help to you and your listeners. Fascinating, Liam. What do you think? Indeed. On that bombshell, (laughs) that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reasoned views. Email of the week, Alison, it's your turn. Oh, Oh, everyone's so good. I thought Ian's was very good. Top of the show. What do you think? Yep, let's go for Ian. So, Ian, if you want your planet normal mug and who wouldn't, they're as rare as rocking <laughs> horse poo, then do email us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk and put in your email subject mug winner. Ian, of course, was saying, come back, Rishi Sunak. All is forgiven is certainly not the answer. If you enjoy Planet Normal, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. There are lots of fantastic reviews there and they can't all be written by co-pilot Halligan's family. It really helps others to find the podcast. She was going to say extended family (laughs) there. Great advantages to having lots of Irish relatives writing in. It really helps others to find the podcast so the fantastic Planet Normal family can grow. It certainly does keep those emails coming in. They're the lifeblood of our show. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view. Thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampitt. Special thanks and best wishes to our editor, Zoe Hitch. And also to the superb Telegraph events team who worked so hard to bring us that brilliant Planet at normal live event last week Lanya Kerrigan Laura Hill and Jade Clark stay safe and in touch with us and with each other until next week it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him 